Scripture reading for today comes from one place in the New Testament, chapter, uh, John chapter 6, verse 35. Follow along as I read. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. This is the word of God. Now we have a choir anthem. Hallelujah. Good afternoon, Shiloh. How are you? We're doing good? All right, that's good to hear. So today, today is, well, starting tomorrow, actually, we'll begin the 23rd day of Lent. So yesterday was the 22nd. Tomorrow, we're going to the 23rd. As you know, Sundays don't count because they count as the days of victory uh, in acknowledgement of the Sabbath day uh, where we recognize that our Lord Jesus Christ resurrected. And having now gone through halfway through the season of Lent, through our opening verse today, John chapter 6, verse 35, I want to talk about Jesus, who is the bread of life. Now, bread of life, it's an expression we hear quite often uh, as we live our lives of faith. And not just in our lives of faith, but uh, even those who may not be Christian, but when they participate in Christian institutions, come to church, for example. Many times when we read our opening scripture for the day, we say, today's bread of life, for example. Or the bread of life for today shall come from John chapter 6, verse 35. So we use this expression, bread of life, but what exactly does it mean? What is the significance behind this? You know, are we saying it too easily, perhaps? Uh, in addition to our opening verse, I'd also like to read together John chapter 6, uh, verses 52 through 58. 52 through 58. Let's read this responsively uh, as we go into our message for today. So John chapter 6, verse 52 through 58. I'll begin with verse 52. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Verse 58, let's read together. Ready, begin. This is the bread which came out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. So let's take a look at the context of what Jesus is saying. Earlier in chapter 6, Jesus is telling the Jews, I am the bread of life. Eat me, and you will live. And the Jews are now asking the question, wait a second, this guy is crazy. He's not making any sense. How are we supposed to eat him? We're not cannibals, and this guy is just not going to shred his flesh so that we can eat. What are we supposed to do? So Jesus hears this, and then he replies, you have to eat me. You see, he doesn't actually give any explanation. He is reiterating the fact that you have to eat him in order to live. So if you look at verse 60, it says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this said, it is difficult. This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? You see, even Jesus' disciples who were following him, who loved him, who accepted his word, he said, you got to eat me. And they're like, man, this is, this is a tough pill to swallow, quite literally. I don't understand. And in verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. You see, this is a very pitiful moment, actually, for many of these disciples. Jesus, who came from heaven down to earth, who we needed to recognize as our Savior, as our true bread of life, 
the disciples said, we can't understand this guy. He wants us to eat him. This is too weird. I'm out of here. So many of his disciples left. And we know it's because they didn't have a true understanding of what this bread is. So, as our first main point for today, let's ask, what is the true bread? What is the true bread? In our opening scripture, John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus actually says, I am the bread of life. He also says the same thing in verse 48. So, based off of this statement, what we can understand is that the true bread is that which gives life. The true bread gives life. And that is the nature of this bread. It's just like water is very refreshing. If you drink water, it quenches your thirst. You know you're drinking water. In the same way, the true bread, it only does according to its nature. So you eat it, it gives you life. When Jesus began his ministry, or before he began his public ministry, if we look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, and also Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, we know that Jesus went out into the wilderness to be tested. He went out, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and at the end of this fast, this period of prayer and devotion, the devil, Satan, came to him wanting to test him. He said, if you are truly the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And how does Jesus respond? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, also Luke chapter 4, verse 4, he says that man does not live on bread alone, but he lives on what? The Word of God. Now, Jesus is saying this after 40 days of fasting. I don't know if anyone's done uh, fasting for multiple days, but it's really difficult. The most I've ever done was seven days. Uh, but even after one or two days, the body starts changing because you're used to having a fuel source. It starts going into, I guess, withdrawal system, s symptoms. You start shaking. You can't focus. Your mind isn't going straight. Even your will, it becomes weaker because you're not physically able to sustain yourself. Now, Jesus went 40 days and 40 nights. How good would even a piece of bread look after that period of fasting? But Jesus says, you will not live on bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, Jesus' time in the wilderness and the temptation that came afterwards, does it remind us of anything from the Old Testament, perhaps? Any takers? The wilderness journey during the Exodus, right? As you know, in the Exodus, the people of Israel, they journeyed in the wilderness for 40 years, and they were fed with the bread from heaven. So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. And actually, follow along with me as we read verse 2 and 3. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Okay, so they're in the wilderness. They came out from Aaron. They haven't had any food, actually. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You see, human beings, uh, we're not very complicated creatures. There are certain things that upset us, that make us angry. And if those certain things happen to us, we are very predictable. One of them is hunger. We get hungry, we get grouchy, we're in a really, really bad mood, especially people here in Korea. I've never seen any other society where they have to eat three square meals a day. It's like you miss breakfast and everyone's like, ah, oh, man, I feel like I'm going to die. I haven't had breakfast. 
Now, I don't know if I'm an American, but I skip breakfast all the time. I've got no problem whatsoever, all right? Or even after I have breakfast, you know, it reaches maybe 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. I can have a late lunch. It's okay. But many people here in Korea, it reaches about 11, 11.30. They're like, man, what am I going to have for lunch? If I don't eat lunch, how am I going to make it through the rest of the day? You know, especially men, Korean men, they come home after work. It could be 6, 7 o'clock, assuming that they're not out with their friends or business partners. If there isn't a bowl of soup and a bowl of rice already prepared for these husbands, they go crazy against their wives. Ladies, right? (laughs) All right, we got an amen. (laughs) I'm not going to explore that topic any further. (laughs) But the point is, we as humans, when we don't eat or when we get something and we're not satisfied, we make our emotions known. We let people know our displeasure. Now imagine, an entire nation, they've been taken out from their homes. Well, not their true home, but they were taken out of the land of Egypt. And they're saying, in this land, we could eat all the meat that we want. We had bread to the full. In Numbers chapter 11, they talk about eating cucumbers and onions, all these good things. So they complain, "Have have you brought us out into the wilderness just so we can die from hunger? So in response to this, Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. And this is the key part. That I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. You see, so God said, All right, I heard your complaints. I'm going to give you food. But... Depending on what you do with this food and how you follow my command, I'm testing you whether or not you will listen to my word. So if you go to verse 35, Exodus 16, verse 35, it says, The sons of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. All right, so until they entered the land of Canaan, 40 years they traveled around in the wilderness, and that is the duration of time that they ate manna. Now, Let's go back to Jesus. Jesus is reflecting this with his 40 years prayer and fasting in the wilderness. And he says at the end, man will not live by bread alone, but they will live by every word of God. And actually, Jesus is citing the Old Testament when he says this to overcome the devil. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verses 1 through 6. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. And let's read this responsively. Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. All the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. Okay, so we see a little bit of motivation. Why did God do things the way that he did? So that the people will be humble. So that the people will be tested. Many times, it could be in our families, it could be in our schools, in our workplaces, with our friends. And it doesn't have to be hunger, but we're tested in certain ways. Somebody hurts our feelings. We're put in a situation where we don't know how to handle or deal with the circumstances. Those instances, God is testing us. Why? Now, if any of you like to exercise or work out, you know that you have to start with something of lower resistance before you can move to something of higher resistance, and gradually you improve. Our life of faith is the same way. We start out with certain trials and tribulations so that God may test us, but it makes us stronger. It makes us more humble. And if we can overcome these trials by understanding the Word of God, then it allows us to be better people of faith. So God is saying, I'm testing you to humble you that I may know what's in your heart. So when we're tested today, problems with our friends or relationships, workplaces, whatever the case may be, 
what is our response going to be? Are we going to whine? Are we going to complain? Are we going to say, this world is not fair. God is not fair. I don't understand why I would be in, in this kind of situation. Or are we going to humble ourselves? Are we going to go back to the Word of God to find our comfort, to find our answers? And through that, are we going to overcome the temptations that come our way just as Jesus overcame the devil using the Word of God? So it is my hope and prayer that all of us, whatever trials and tribulations we're going through, may we follow the path of Jesus. May we know, understand, and have trust in the Word of God so that we can overcome every temptation and trial that come our way. Amen? So, we talked about the true bread. It gives life, and it gives life how? Through the Word. Let's explore this concept a little further of the Word of God being the true bread. The Word of God being the true bread. So come back with me to John chapter 6. So remember, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus replies, using Deuteronomy chapter 8, that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And in John chapter 6, Jesus is talking about how you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood in order to have eternal life. But Jesus does one clarification. In John chapter 6, verse 63, what does he say? He says, it is the Spirit who gives life. Okay, so Jesus is saying, you have to eat my flesh, drink my blood in order to live. But then now he explains a little bit further. If you're going to live, it's because of the Spirit, because the Spirit gives life. And then he says, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So the Word of God is spirit and life. If you look at John chapter 1, verse 1, it says that the Word is God. And in verse 14, it says that the Word is became flesh. Jesus is saying, you have to eat my flesh. What is he saying? You have to eat my words. See, in order to eat Jesus Christ, what that means is to accept his words so that his words abide in us and that we abide in the word. So when you look at the Bible and how it testifies of Jesus Christ, we know it's not the physical flesh. It's not the physical blood. But he's saying, the word that is me, the word that is God, this word that became flesh, it needs to be inside of you. So let me ask, is the word inside of us today? In the Lord's Prayer, which we say just about every day, Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, what does it say? Give us this day our daily bread. And what does that mean? What is our daily bread? Every day are we praying. Every day are we listening to the Word. Every day are we reading the Word. Are we considering the Word in our minds and in our hearts? Are we proclaiming it with our mouths? Give us this day our daily bread. The Israelites in the wilderness, every day except for the Sabbath, they had to go out and get the manna. And they got enough manna for that day's worth. On the Sabbath day, of course, because they had to rest, it didn't come. So the day before, on the sixth day, they got twice as much for that day and for the next day. So let me ask again, every day, are you partaking of the daily manna? Are you partaking of the bread of life? If we go to John chapter 6, verses 47 and 48, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes 
has eternal life. I am the bread of life. So you eat this bread, and what happens? You believe. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says what? Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. You hear the Word of God, you develop faith. You have faith, it means you believe. You believe, it means you have eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world, whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. But who are we believing? Are we believing a historical figure? Are we believing a man that appears in the Bible that the Bible talks about and testifies of? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Why is Jesus so significant to us? Because through Jesus, the Word of God has come to us. See, the very essence of God Himself is the Word, and God Himself came to us. The Word had come to us through Jesus Christ, and that is what we believe. Going back to John chapter 6, verse 63, the Word of God is what gives you life. The Word contains the Spirit of God. So if it is inside of you, then believe that you have eternal life. Amen? Okay. So main point number two. It's actually some more questions. But this bread is very mysterious. We looked a little bit at what it is, but another aspect of this bread that I want to share is where it comes from. So where does it come from? And also, where does it go? Now, the second question might seem a little bit weird uh, right now. It's like, wait, the bread is supposed to go somewhere. We know it comes from heaven. We'll explore that. That's pretty obvious. Um, but stick with me, and then we'll cover where it goes afterwards. If you look at John chapter 6, verse 33, and also verse 58. In verse 33, it says, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to this world. Now, this makes sense, right? God is in heaven. So in order for the word to come to us, in order for the bread to come down to us, it needs to go from heaven to earth. So it's very obviously a downward movement. And in verse 58, it says, This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died, but he who eats this bread will live forever. So Jesus himself is saying that this bread comes down out from heaven. But ultimately, what is he testifying? I came from heaven. Not, not me as the person, but Jesus himself. I came from heaven and I'm with you. Imagine, God is in a place where we can't be. We can't even imagine it. We can't even perceive, we can't even comprehend its existence or its actuality. But from there, Jesus, the Word made flesh, came down to us in order to be with us, right? Now imagine you're deeply in love with somebody. They're in a place or they're in a position where they can't go. But you want to be with them. So whether it's you're buying a plane ticket, you've got to climb mountains, you've got to swim across the ocean, whatever it is, you want to be with that person. Now, we can understand this in a human sense. There are many songs, there are many poems, there are many love letters that express this kind of thing. But the ultimate love letter, the Word of God, the Bible itself is saying that from heaven, God himself came down in order to be with us, for God to be with us. Emmanuel, right? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. God has come to be with us because He loves us that much. We've got no way of going to Him, but He has come down to us. Now, Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. We read it before, but I'll write it down again. And what does it say? It says that I will rain down bread from heaven to give to Israel. So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, once again. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. 
See, God is saying that this manna will rain down from heaven, and this is the bread that will feed Israel. And John chapter 6, verse 38, going back to that again, Jesus is saying, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. Jesus is saying, I came from heaven to do the will of God. I came from heaven to do the will of God. So we looked at where the bread comes from. But let's look at something that might sound a little strange. Let's look at where the bread goes. Oops. My labeling is not very good. Where does this bread go? We read John chapter 6, verse 38, just now. Let's also read verse 39. So starting with verse 38, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me. That all that, has, that he has given to me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. See, we see this interesting expression. That what comes down is raised back up. Oftentimes when we pray, oftentimes when we ask for blessings, what do we say? Father God, please open the doors of heaven, rain down blessings upon us. But there's actually something more that we need in addition to receiving the blessings that come down. These blessings need to go back up. See, Jesus, he came down upon this earth, but did he stay here? No, right? He went into the earth, he resurrected from the dead, and then he ascended into heaven. So when we talk about the bread of life that comes down from heaven, it doesn't just stay here, but it goes back up to the Father. The fruit of resurrection needs to go back. When rain falls down from heaven, does the water just stay in the ground not doing anything? We have um, a pastor here. He's actually one of my supervising pastors, Pastor Song. And he's Chloe's dad, by the way. And one thing great about him is he likes to do a little bit of farming. He actually plants sweet potatoes all around the campus. They are the most delicious sweet potatoes you will ever have. But in order for such plants to grow, what do you need? You bury it, but you also need to water it, right? You have to depend on the rain from heaven to come down. Well, now we have modern irrigation, but back then, you really depended on the rain from heaven to come and give life to your crops. And we see spiritually that this applies to the Word as well, as well. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 through 11. Now remember, we talked about the Word, which is the bread of life. We talked about this Word, this bread coming down from heaven. So Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. You see, God is saying, I'm going to send my word and it's going to come back to me. But... It's not going to come back to me empty. It's going to come back having fulfilled my will. What did Jesus say? I came down from heaven to do the will of the Father. What is the Father's will? That not one of these will be lost, but it will be raised up. See, so the word has come down. It's going to go back up. Where do we want to go? We want to go to heaven, right? How do we go there? There's no train. There's no plane. 
There's no rocket. There's no portal that will take us into heaven. But the Word of God is supposed to go back. So if you follow the Word, if the Word is within you, if you are with the Word, as the Word goes back, it's going to take you with it. Do you believe this? See, we believe in the resurrection. John chapter 5, verse 25. There will be a day when if you hear the words of the Son of Man, you will come back to life. But not just the resurrection, we also have the transfiguration, where while you're still alive, by hearing and being obedient to the Word of God, as the Word goes up, you will also go back up. So I don't know exactly what the process is. I've never seen resurrection. I don't know how it works. I've never seen transfiguration. I don't know how it works. But I think, I believe, that because the Word has come down to earth and it's going to go back to heaven, if we are going to go to heaven, we have to do it through the Word. That is what will take us there. That is what will give us eternal life. Even though you die, you will live. If you live, you will live forever. Amen? Okay. So in Isaiah chapter 55, we see that the water, the rain, it comes down and it goes back. Hosea chapter 14, verse 2. It says that when you return to God, you have to take the words with you. See, we can't go to God empty-handed, but we take the words with us. The word of what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The word of redemptive history. The word of eternal life. That word, we receive it, we understand we are sinful beings. If we confess Jesus Christ, if we confess our sins, and we are forgiven of that, it means we're granted eternal life. And that is how we return to God. Now turn with me to Numbers chapter 11, verse 9. Numbers chapter 11, verse 9. Here it also talks about manna. And verse 9, it says, When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. Okay? When the dew fell at the camp, the manna would come with it. Now, in Hebrew, this expression for fell is yarad. Yarad. And also in Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 10, which we read earlier, when it talks about the rains coming down, it also uses this word, yarad. But now turn with me to Exodus, chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. Exodus 16, chapter chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. It came about at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. Okay, so in Numbers, we read about the dew that would fall. In Exodus, we're seeing again, there's a layer of dew around the camp that came in evening. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground, okay? So it said that the dew evaporates. And as it evaporates, there's a fine flake-like thing. This, we know, is manna. Now, those of you who have the Korean Bible, I believe it says that when the dew dries, you know, it, it just dries, and then there's manna. The English expression is a little bit more precise scientifically. It evaporates. What does that mean? It means that there's something on the ground as water, and it goes into the atmosphere as a gas. But the Hebrew word for this, what it says is, it's Allah. Allah. So yarad, we saw, means to descend, to come down. What do you think Allah means? In Hebrew, it means to go up 
and to ascend. So literally, it's saying, when the dew goes back up, then there was manna on the ground. So the word comes and it goes back up. It is through this coming down and going up that we have something to eat. Jesus came down upon this earth. He ascended. Because he ascended, we believe in his gospel of life. We study the word of God. We have something to eat. So we can see how through the Old Testament giving of manna, it testifies of the mission and will of God through Jesus Christ. He comes down and he comes back up. So, as a conclusion for today, what is the redemptive historical significance of this bread of life? This bread that gives life, this bread that is the word of God, this bread that came down from heaven and went back up into heaven. As part of this conclusion, I want to discuss the genealogy. If you go to Genesis chapter 5, we have the genealogy of the ten generations that come from Adam. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 5. And who are these generations? We have Adam, Seth, Enosh, and then Canaan, Mahalalel, Mahalalel, oh, that's a tough one, and then Jared, and then Enoch, and then Methuselah, Salah, and then Lamech, and Noah. Now, for those of you who have been in church for a while and we've studied the History of Redemption series, which two names in this genealogy stand out from the others? Enoch and Noah. So, there's Enoch, but I don't want to talk about Noah. I want to talk about Jared. Enoch lived forever. 365 years he was on this earth, and then he went up to heaven. So, he lives infinity. Methuselah, who was the son of this Enoch who transfigured, lived the longest, 969 years. Do you know who lived the second longest? Do you know who lived the second longest? It was actually Jared. Jared lived 962 years. Now, why is that significant? Take a look at this name, Jared. Does it look like something we've looked at earlier? The name Jared means to descend, to come down. It comes from the same root word as this, Yarad. So you follow the genealogy. Jared, by himself, he testifies of the word of God that comes down, of Jesus Christ who descended from heaven, of the hope, of the peace that we have that has come to us. And who is Jared's son? Enoch. What did Enoch do? Enoch ascended into heaven. And what does Enoch's name mean? It means dedicated, dedicated to God. It means teacher, teaching the word of God, teaching about God. So even through the genealogy, we can see that the word of God, as it comes down, it's supposed to ascend. See, because Enoch received the word that was coming down to him, he was able to ascend into heaven, and through his life, through his transfiguration, he was able to teach that if you are dedicated to God, then you also will have eternal life. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, 14 through 21. Now, Matthew chapter 14, it talks about 
the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 14, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. You see, wherever Jesus went, there were large crowds following him. They wanted to hear his words and they wanted to receive his healing. It was evening. The disciples came and said, this place is desolate and the hour is late. Send the crowds away that they may go into the villages to buy food for themselves. Now remember, Jesus, he kept them around. Why? Because he felt compassion for them. How compassionate would he be if in this late hour, they just sent him away? You know, Koreans particularly, they want to take care of friends and guests. You bring somebody into your house, you want to take care of them. You always offer some fruits or some snacks or some drink, coffee. You never send them away empty-handed. Jesus had compassion on them. How could he send them away empty-handed? Verse 16, he says, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Now, do you think Jesus was talking about physical food? Or do you think he was talking about spiritual food? Before he began his ministry, Jesus said that man lives off of, not bread, but the word of God. You see, all of us that are here, all of us that have come to church, all of us that receive the word of God, we're not here because we want to be here. We're here because we're in such a pitiful state. We're such terrible people. We're in such need to be saved from sin. God, by his mercies, somehow he brought us here to feed us. Feed us with what? With the word that has come down from heaven. Now, are we going to be like the scrabble or the rabble, the useless folks who just ate the food and left without giving thanks? Or do we see this word as our way into heaven, as eternal life, where when we eat, we give thanks? Verse 17, they said to him, we only have five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Verse 19, ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took five loaves and the two fish. Looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food. So as we continue on to verse 21, we see that they broke the bread, they spread it out. 5,000 men, only men that were counted, not counting women and children, they were fed to the fullest. And what does it say in verse 21? Oh yeah, verse 21 It says 5,000 men ate besides women and children. Verse 20, after they picked up the broken pieces that were left over, 12 full baskets. See, when the word of God comes to you, when the word of God feeds you, you are able to eat your fill and there's still more left over, more than what you can possibly consume. That is the love and the grace that we get from God, from the bread that comes down from heaven. In conclusion, let's read together 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And this is ultimately why we believe in what we believe, what our hope is in these end times, what our ultimate goal is in our life of faith. Let's read this responsively, beginning with verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do do the rest who have no hope. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Okay, what does it say in verse 16? The Lord himself will what? Descend. Will come down. And then the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17 Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, let's read verse 18 together. Begin. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. How precious is this? What does it say? We who are alive, we will be caught up with them. We will meet the Lord in the clouds. 
So what does it mean? It says that the Lord will descend, the dead in Christ will rise, and with them we will go up and meet the Lord. And so we shall always be with the Lord. See, when Jesus came, he came with what name? According to Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah prophesied about this. So, if we are with the Lord always, we have every reason to have peace. We have every reason to be comfortable. The Apostle Paul is saying, comfort one another with these words. So, what does it mean for us? Do you believe that we receive the bread of life? Amen. Now, the bread of life, you receive it. What's it supposed to do now? Does it stay with you? Do you keep it in? Does it go into the toilet? I hope not. <laughs> or is it going to work within you? Are you going to proclaim it? And is this living and active word going to take you into heaven? As Shiloh International Missions, let us proclaim this living bread of life that is able to raise the dead back to life and those that are alive is able to take them to heaven through the transfiguration. Amen. Let's pray. Our loving Father God, we thank you so much for your love and for your grace. We thank you especially that you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to come down upon this earth and through his death, through his resurrection, and through his ascension, we have the living testimony of hope to be with you in heaven. Father God, just as this word has come down to us, let it not stay here, but let us take these words and return to you. Let us live a life, Father God, of sanctification let us live a life of returning back to you so that as we declare your gospel, as we declare your word of redemptive history, we can proclaim it to all the world who needs to come out from the darkness, who needs to come out from the spiritual death and into eternal life. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we may forever be with you. And we pray in his name. Amen. Let's give glory to our Father.